my first book club. Oh, thank you. I'm curious to start that this book. Maybe the first question to go, I would say, what is the most surprising or striking part of this book? I can start. <laughs> yeah? Sure. Um, so I have two surprising things I'd like to talk about. Um, one is personal and the other is more about the book. Mm -hmm. I'll start with the book one first. Um, now, I, I didn't read very much of the book and you'll hear why when I talk about my personal part, but what w sticks out in my mind is I'm sure I heard him talking about the sound of water, the rhythm of water, but it was something about the water sound weaving in mm -hmm with the land and that I had never thought of water in that regard, like the sound. So today actually I chose, I'll just stand up. I chose to wear a belt that I found on my thrift store treasure hunts um, and it has um, shells on it. So to me, it carries the energy of water. I actually think it might even be indigenous, but it's indigenous to somewhere. I don't know exactly yeah. where that. I recognize the cowrie shells. So cowrie yeah. shells were often used as currency in like certain countries. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Oh. Um, so I thought because my body is made up with a lot of water, as yeah. our mm. bodies, um, <laughs> I would be the sound of water, you know, as yeah. I move um, yeah. in this, oh, this group. So, yeah. um, and I would begin to explore that mm. idea of water being a sound that's in our world. So this is my beginning exploration of that. Now, the thing for me was um, I started to read the book and then I, um, where I read about the sound and also I read go to the water to read the book. Well, I just go to the water, respect the water, protect the water. That's just, you know, kind of that. But as I flip through the book, um, two things happened. One, I noticed that there was a, a underlying violence in the language mm -hmm. um, that mm -hmm. was very disturbing to me. And unfortunately for me, it triggered um, very unhealed traumatic memory of when I was a young teen. So it was really like unexpected. Um, and I had to just back out of the book. Um, I'm interested to hear good stories, hopefully, coming from the same book and that that will be one way to, you know, to change my own story or not change it, but to find something new. In general, with like Western epistemological understandings of like the world, we have a very like set concrete structure of like beginning and middle and end and whatnot. And this happens like everywhere. This manifests themselves in like stories and like in even research papers. You know, you have like the introduction, you have like the body of the paper, and then you have like the ending. So like having this book kind of like end abruptly with not really any sort of like um, kind of like how do, would you say like you have the introduction, yeah, which kind of conceptualizes the entire book, mm -hmm. and then you have the um, you have the body of the book, but the body doesn't have a set structure or flow mm -hmm. to it. It simply just is a um, collection, I guess. It's yeah. hard to explain it, but yeah. I guess structurally that was, I guess, like I would, like, I, I would say it's a bit surprising to me because like mm -hmm. I'm just not used to it. And a little bit of shock that there is like a, yeah, like there is an awareness that they, these things exist, but mm -hmm. like, I guess like um, being placed in a context where it's, um, where it's frankly like not really regarded, I guess, if that makes sense. Like mm -hmm. it's not really like surprising or deliberate, like, like, or actually like, you know, like it's like a standout thing of the book. It's just a part of the book that exists and it um, mm -hmm. happens is like, um, I guess, I know it's a bit of a mundane thing to be surprised about, but I guess I'm quite surprised oh. about it. Yeah. I was doing climate change related research. And then because the World Water Day was uh, mid-March, so it came, Suddenly, somehow I ran into this, uh, his name and his book. And then I started uh, picking up this book and I had the same reaction because I was looking for more comprehensive approach and yet a little bit more logical, uh, rational uh, approach. And uh, exactly that introduction and is quickly will switch art uh, expressions, poetry, visuals, and so forth. And then I realized that uh, well, not only he was inviting us to engage, this is a more engaging in a sense because he's not 
telling what to do, but he's kind of engaging us to sort of make it very evocative in the using arts to us to really go deep. Also, these pictures, you know, the frozen pictures uh, he took, and the water is actually moved from fluid to the viper state and to the solid part. So it's a quite water is shape shifter. So the book is constantly embody that the nature of water, you know. And then second part that I noticed myself in this part of the world, we're not so accustomed to uh, encounter book like this when it comes to environmental sustainability or climate change because of the art. Why do we refrain uh, from making art? And what are the things that held us back? Uh, why we are so not necessarily reluctant to, but and willingly to embrace. It's more interesting to me to see the, the author has a, uh, said that uh, the water has a spirit. I've never thought of water that, uh, in that sense. Uh, to me, or from the culture that I'm from, we have uh, God for everything. We have God uh, for the tree, or uh, God for the land, God for the bed even, uh, and, and, and we have God uh, that protects the fishermen from the rough sea when they're out in the ocean and uh, catching the fish. Uh, so the God uh, is the, the, the God is to tame the rough water or the, the, the rough sea uh, in order for the fishermen can come back safely. So in that sense, we don't have a god for for the ocean, but a god to protect the fishermen from the rough sea. So yeah, so it's very interesting uh, to see how uh, how differently people look at at uh, elements on, on on this earth. So uh, yeah, that is uh, something that is interesting to me. I'm just kind of curious about like so I've never really grown up in this culture like I actually like I, like you know like Chinese Canadian like Chinese culture I guess like I, I kind of exist on the outside because I have to like I'm a Chinese Canadian so like you have to fit in the mold of like the kind of anglicized Canadian voice but like my mom is like you know she immigrated from Hong Kong so she has this kind of like you know this different perspective from things and oftentimes she brings up feng shui you know, yeah i want to know more about it i mm -hmm. like you know she, oftentimes it comes up because like you know i play something wrong and she doesn't like it because it violates that kind of principle and like mm -hmm. of course it's a different epistemology but of course feng shui often invokes water and i don't yes. exactly understand exactly how so my mom would tell me stories about like how like in her old job, like in Hong Kong or something like that, if I remember correctly, she sat in a place that violated the feng shui principles and mm. she got very ill as a result. And I remember oh. she telling her telling me this. And like, you know, when I was younger, I was like, mom, come on, <laughs> you know, it's like, you, you know, of course, like, you know, you don't, you, you, when you grow up in an epist a Western epistemology, you tend to kind of, you know, when, like, this is just the scars of colonial violence, but like um, we tend to reject other worldviews. Yeah. You know? yeah, we yeah. tend to feel like our understanding is in here inherently like like you know um, I, I, like you know just inherently the right understanding, mm -hmm. but it tends to shut out like you know of course like most of the world because you know not everyone sees the world the same way and like mm. it's. Um, you know, we oftentimes lead to a culture where there is a rejection of the alternative of yeah. the of the um, of you know the indigenous. I guess we would mm -hmm. say. Yeah. No. Yeah. Uh, I agree with you. I used to um, think that well, we should test and then do experiment and see what the uh, evidence. But I kind of cross over to a point where we can science cannot prove obviously everything, no matter how good the measurement or how good this uh, tool is, it is impossible to prove everything. So we probably need a new way of thinking that knowing that wisdom, it works. Hmm. Yeah. It's, it's interesting though, like I feel like, um, especially like with traditional ecological knowledge, it's oftentimes Western understandings that have to catch up, right? Mm -hmm. Like, um, I remember this story um, in, I want to say the 19, or something like that, you know, um, 
during the British colonial era, they were um, so like back then. Okay, so this is the story of like malaria. So like back then, people were catching malaria, and so like um, you know, like no one knew, like no one in the Western world knew that where malaria came from. You know, now we nowadays we know where it's it's from mosquitoes, and you know, like the like transfer of parasites as a result of mosquitoes. But like. At the time, you know, the Somali locals in the area knew that it came from mosquitoes, but they were immediately dismissed for being superstitious because, of course, the concept of like this insect, like, you know, giving you like a disease, you know, like this mysterious, invisible disease is like implausible, but like someone catching it out of the blue is possible. So like, you know, like nowadays, of course, it feels so obvious to us. But like back then, you know, like, of course, like, first of all, like understandings of like, First of all, there was like this underlying current of like, of course, like inferiority, you know, like these opinions of the indigenous are not worthy. They are not like, you know, they're superstitious, you know, there's dismissal. But, you know, of course, turns out they were right. And like, you know, these kinds of like, um, it's just reflective of these kind of values that we kind of have normalized of like rejection and like um, hostility towards alternative um, mm -hmm. understandings and like, you know, traditional ecological knowledge right now has served to kind of illustrate a lot of things that we don't understand about mm. the world that I always wondered that the um, for Japan like 300 years ago human intervention to create the water table a recharging station where water can be quickly absorbed through technique mm. um, which is Paddy fields, and then amazing amount of water uh, can be restored underground. Uh, with the only city in in the Japan and perhaps maybe in the world to supply the drinking water 100% for over 700 people, uh, without any we don't have a water facility treatment either. Mm -hmm. But this is not just by coincidence that because of the location, because of the precipitations, it's constant, constant. Uh, human intervention improvement. Well, so growing up, I, I had to, we all study, we had to learn that where the water comes from, because obviously the groundwater is uh, invisible. And I, my question is that why 300 years old uh, ago, the people who did interventions, or even before that, how did they know how to engineer the structure? And back then, they don't have uh, computers, anything. So all they had was the their observation of five senses. So they're connected to the nature. So they had to basically go with everything that they have with five senses that what we have. It just amazes me that how did they have that knowledge? Maybe they had a different knowledge that we've lost. Yes. Somehow. Yes. Yeah. Some different sense that we maybe don't have mm -hmm. or has atrophied in us due to mm -hmm. mechanization yeah. or something. Yeah, and then another important aspect of the social part, which people create rituals, festivals, so that mm -hmm. common people Our can naturally yeah. engage with that you know, celebration of life. In anything to do with water, there's a, so many festivals. So you don't really have to think logically. It's just a part of way of life. When I was growing up, people very, very consciously using water. Even though we have so much water, you only use what you only need and not waste. So that concept is just so ingrained in that parts of the cultural practice, which is also important to facilitate. But one of my art practices, I was doing some deep ancestral healing work and I had, um, I was right in the midst of it, and I was out walking one day, and I walked past a small oak branch that had mm. fallen down in the windstorm, and I just felt really strong, compelled to pick it up. I felt guided and asked um, to pick it up, so I did, because I've learned to just listen to, you know, my intuitive senses. And I took it home, and I put it on my I call it my, my healing altar. It was a, a lovely embroidered dress mm -hmm. a, about a 10-year-old girl would wear, and all of my symbolic objects were on that altar. Um, and I felt like I needed to put the this on top of everything, the oak um, branch. So I did, and then I thought, well, 
why is this happening? Why do I feel like this? Why, why am I being asked to do this by this oak branch? Mm. And I got really curious and I sort of looked into oak medicine. Um, and first of all, it went back to my own ancestry of a druid. Mm. Druids would use oak very much mm. and it was considered the tree of life. And it, and it is a medicinal plant and it's used to draw out poison. And so it was sat on my altar. It sat in my living room floor in the middle of the floor for about three or four weeks. And all of a sudden I just felt like a huge pain burden had been lifted off of me and just went away. And I thought, wow, like, you know, that's just amazing to me. It just was effortless. The plant did the work for me. And I was like, wow, <laughs> what's going on? Um, but it was very real. Um, yeah, and so the drawing out of poison, that, that's what the plant does. It drew the poison mm -hmm. out of my ancestral line. Mm -hmm. And I know what that, some of that poison is. Um, I began to have a relationship with the oak, uh, the oak tree, the oak medicine, you can burn the leaves for a smudge. I smudged and eventually the branch asked me to just return it back to a forest and it was gonna take that poison and just disperse, do whatever it does. I'm assuming it would just disperse mm -hmm. naturally. Um, so my point being coming back to the water, perhaps if we learn to listen to the water, mm -hmm. little sound, yeah. you know, <laughs> maybe the water has answers for us maybe the water can tell us how we can move forward what the water needs us to do mm. um yeah so that that's just kind of my point like mm. where we think we know best mm. but perhaps we don't we need to find ways to listen individually and also um hopefully one day as a community or you know beginning communities um so that that's my point mm -hmm. maybe for me anyways personally that's my beginning is to i've been thinking about this i've been mulling it over so like um this has been a thought that i've been kind of having for the past like long time you know like i love nature i love like yeah. i'm obsessed with it i can like probably identify a lot of plants like like from sight alone i think in vancouver there's a lot of um the city planning is often a little like more green centric than a lot of other places like for example new york city new york city is like a concrete jungle it doesn't it has like all the nature relegated into like one portion and like the thing is, is that I'm thinking about this and like Vancouver's city design oftentimes is actually very exclusionary of native plants. Like we see, we rarely do see native plants in British Columbia, like um, especially in Vancouver. Like, of course, outside of Vancouver, there's a lot. But like I've like I've been on this kind of slow journey as of late thinking about like see, wanting to see a lot of the native plants here. Like we mm -hmm. like when I was growing up, I would always go to Nature Park and there was a brochure that they would hand out and there was like all these native plants yeah. and you'd only see like a handful every time you visit there mm -hmm. and that's just because so richmond nature park is like this bastion of native plants that hasn't been developed and outside of there you rarely see the plants you see there other elsewhere but these are all native to lulu island which is richmond and like you know like labrador tea salal um you know like um like you know uh, other plants like that like you know like um, i'm trying to think about it like blueberries and whatnot and like you you tend to see them sometimes, like very rarely, but like they're oftentimes artificial and like you never see them in a natural context, you know, you never see them like um, they're always you always see other plants. You always see introduced plants like you know, a lot of the plants that we interact with here normally right now are like forced entries, I guess, if, you, if that makes sense, like. Not until like a like a week ago, I haven't seen the native BC dogwood. You know, all the dogwoods we mm -hmm. see are from Asia or Cornus, Florida, which is from eastern the eastern United States. I actually took a photo of it. Like I mm -hmm. saw it, and I I immediately noticed it was the BC dogwood because it had six petals. It had like a large center. It was like it's beautiful. I was just so struck by that. But like it took what? Like I'm 21 right now, so like. Mm -hmm. It took 21 years to see one of these things. And this is the provincial flower, right? Like, it's crazy to me that we've, I've never seen it because we, oftentimes we normalize these kinds of like external, like we don't normalize indigenous flora. The most common plants that I see that are like normalized are like the pine trees that we have. So we have like Douglas fir and Western hemlock and, mm -hmm. you know, um, Western red cedar, you know, like I grew up with the Western red cedar. It was in our backyard. It sadly passed away, sadly, but like, 
you know, these things are, I feel like, aren't like aren't normalized in Vancouver city planning as much. And I feel like there sh they should be because like, we really don't see enough native plants. Like if you look at like every anywhere here, like it's like, you know, just like the backyard, for example, you don't see a lot of native plants. You have like a lot of laurel and like magnolia and like, you know, um, like Andromeda and like maple, but these aren't like native plants. These are all like introduced. Like, you know, like when I was walking past, you know, I saw like, you know, um, you know, like red dead nettle and, um, you know, like Herb Robert and like, um, you know, like Creeping Buttercup. But these are all like, again, introduced. And it's like, you rarely see like native plants like peek out from, you know, underground. Like, you know, you don't see like starflower or bunchberry or like, you know, other plants, you know, it's just kind of like heartbreaking, I guess, you know. Mm -hmm. I've been this kind of, uh, on this kind of like subconscious journey of trying to find as much native plants as I could. I really want to go to Camosun Bog this summer. So maybe oh, like, yeah. Together. Yeah, that'd be cool. wonderful. I went to Muscom Park the other day. Mm -hmm. There's a Chinese couple who are harvesting uh, dandelion leaves. Oh. And I asked them, um, what are you going to make a tea? And they said, no, no, no. We are going to boil quickly and then chop up and then make a dumpling. Where you come from? And she says, uh, uh, I'm from northern part of China. Oh. And um, yeah, we had a really good chat at the Muscom yeah. Park this time of a year. It's covered with dandelion. It's a beautiful. Mm -hmm. And I, I was just, oh, you know what? We can start like a dandelion festival. A dandelion festival. Yeah, because yeah, you can so consume uh, for health. Oh, man. So um, I'm majoring in anthropology right now. So um, mm -hmm. I could never get into biology because, frankly, I'm just really horrible at math. That's just the blunt truth of it. If I had the like the you know the the math background, I probably would have been in biology because, you know, I love biology. But anthropology interacts with biology often almost like intangibly. So there's anthropological biology and whatnot. So like, yeah. But I think the reason why I love plants so much and nature so much in general is just the ethos of how I was brought up because. Um, I feel like um, my parents instilled a kind of love for nature for in me that like kind of was different from other kids because I often I grew up in a space where like n nature and um, like the natural world was kind of normalized in a way that was kind of in a way that was like accessible to me because my my mom specifically really loved going outside she like lo she's still walking and like you know like you know finding the time to like enjoy nature whenever she's walking outside and you know we've connected over that and it's like um you know like my late father like kind of um you know was really like invested in like outdoor activities so like um i think i brought this up to gail before but like we've we were often at the ocean because of his um his sailing program so like mm -hmm. you know i would um I would oftentimes be at the beach and kind of like, um, you know, be in inter interaction, direct interaction with nature whenever I was able to. And like, you know, there was this time in my life when I was just like, so like, I would drag my family outside to like, catch bugs or like, go like, walk in the like nature park or something with me because like, I, and I still do that because I, I frankly just love nature so much. Uh, sharing with others. It's um, that's the first things we need to start doing it because it's very organic and you know, but at the same time it's, it's very um, genuine and, and people can make all kinds of connections too. And then asking people to join your effort, like you, you're asking mom to join you, and then see the changes happen. And then as soon as you share something, oh, I want to join you. You know, that sort of the centric circle grows. I think that that small change matters.